I will uh, say the words and then I will repeat after me. Alabare, alabare. Alabare, alabare. Alabare a mi señor. Alabare a mi señor. I'll repeat two times. Then we say, Juan vio el número. Juan vio el número. De los redimidos. De los redimidos. Y todos alababan al Señor. Y todos alababan oh, al Señor. Oh, I made a mistake here, sorry. It's alababam. <laughs> alababan al Señor. Unos cantaban. Unos cantaban. Otros oraban. Otros oraban. Pero todos. Pero todos. Alababan al Señor. Alababan al Señor. Oh, okay. There, you ready to sing it? You sing with me. Alabaré, 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 alabaré a mi Señor. Two times. And then let me sing you for the other part because it's more difficult. el número de los redimidos. It's like a tongue twister. <laughs> okay, let's try if this piano works. It was working yesterday. No. Well, this is not enough. Then we might be back in trouble. Let's try. Alabaré, 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 el número de los redimidos y todos alababan al Señor unos cantaban otros oraban pero todos alababan al Señor alabaré, alabaré alabaré, alabaré alabaré a mi Señor very good alabaré means I will praise I will praise uh, my Lord Mi señor. Interesting, in Spanish we use the same word for Mr. John, same word we use for Lord. Señor could be Mr., could be a Lord. There's a story about a missionary. I'm from Guatemala. Are you familiar with Wycliffe? Mm -hmm. It's a mission that translates the Bible. Do you find anything? Um, possible. Okay, I can tell my stories. <laughs> it's good to have stories, you know, when they're working. <laughs> Um, I was telling that, oh, but Wycliffe. Wycliffe is a missionary organization that translates the Bible in different languages. And the first missionaries from Wycliffe came to Guatemala. In Guatemala, we still have 22 languages, no dialects, 22 languages, plus several dialects. Well, anyway, Cameron Townsend was a missionary, first missionary of Wycliffe. He came to Guatemala, and he, he knew just little Spanish when he came. That was back in the 19th century, I think, 1800s. And then he wanted to talk to people, you know, share his faith. So he found uh, one person on the street, and he asked a question. Usted sabe, uh, uh, he asked him, do you know about Lord Jesus? But in Spanish, when you translate, we sound like this. Conoce usted al Señor Jesús. So he understood, do you know Mr. Jesus? Jesus is a name in Spanish, mm -hmm. Jesus. So the other person said, yes, of course, I know Mr. Jesus. He lives two blocks from here and he goes on a store. So he learned, you know, that the word for el Señor is the same for Mr. and for Lord. But in this case, we're singing about our Lord Jesus. Anyway, my name is Edward Cajas. I'm from Guatemala. And I'm teaching right now at Southwestern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm the first Latin in the faculty of School of Music ever. So I really feel privileged. No, I was a student, I came as a student many years ago. I uh, got my master's in church music, went back to Guatemala to work for 12 years. Then I came back for another degree in piano performance. And um, then I met my wife in the seminary, we married. That's why I tell people you're single. Seminaries and colleges are the, one of the best places to find If you're following Lord's will, of course. So we married and we went back to Guatemala and we started the school for music teaching. See, my life is so full of experiences. When I graduated the first time from the School of Music in Southwestern, my idea was to train ministers of music. 
in churches in Guatemala. And God really blessed what I was doing. And I did a lot of workshops. I taught people, you know, how to conduct uh, choirs, teach songs, how to play piano, all of this. But then I thought, I think we need to start with children. Because really, if you want to change things, you know, in your country, the place where you're working. And that's my recommendation. Working with adults is great. But if you want to teach something like languages, sport, and music, it's better when you start very young. And then I saw, well, where I'm going to get the teachers to teach these children. So that's why the Lord really gave me the vision to start a school for music teachers. Mm -hmm. I attended the Orf is you are familiar with the Orf method, mm -hmm. music education, when you use violin and all, and then arimpas and saxophones. So I went to Salzburg. I had the opportunity to study in Austria one summer. And then really, that's why I became my, my conversion to music education started there. Okay. Because I saw all kinds of things that you can do teaching children. And the ORF method, you don't need a piano. You don't need a blackboard because you need your own body. The language becomes, you know, the first uh, uh, basis for teaching rhythm. For example, my name is Cedar, my name is Cedar, my name is Edward, my name is Cedar. So I can use, you know, this phrase translated into instruments. So anyway, so the Lord uh, gave me the vision, and we started in 1995 school for music teachers. Was the first accredited school by the government of Guatemala. There are many seminaries of proper degrees in Latin America, but they are not uh, accredited. So my idea was, you know, to give the students a way to make their own living. So we offer certificates in music education. It's like a music education program, but it's a four-year program. And so we have graduated about 120 music teachers. They work in the public private schools in Guatemala, and also they work in the churches. Mm -hmm. See, for me, music is music. Doesn't matter if you're using to teach uh, children in public school, doesn't matter if you're using the church. Of course, in the church, we know that the role is not just teaching music, right? It's using music as a vehicle, as a tool to share the music. So today we're going to talk about um, some Hispanic practices. Um, again, how many of you have been involved or have visited a Hispanic church in the United States? In the United States. No, where, 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 were you a missionary? In, well, in Bolivia. Oh, in Bolivia. OK, but here in the United States? Um, Never? No, I'm part of communion Spanish Sapuri and Calvin, but I didn't go to Spanish church. Oh, yeah. I will suggest that you need to go to a Baptist, uh, Hispanic church at least one yeah, time I to will, experience. Yeah. yeah. I will be sure to give from your Oh, OK, good. OK. Someone else have experience? Uh, I have a. A niece, whose husband is from the Dominican Republic, oh, I, and they they worship. I mean, they live down in, in uh, uh, Florida. Okay, well, they you know they go on Thursday night, Friday night, and they do Saturday and Sunday. So we've gone to worship service with them, and and it's been I, mean, I don't know Spanish, <laughs> but when Switched I'm I'm hearing it. It has some of the Dutch and some of the oh, Spanish. It's very close to each other. Oh, okay. So if I knew the song, yeah, I knew exactly what they, what they were singing. Yes, so yes. It, it was, you know, my husband looked at me and he says, I didn't know that stuff. And I said, oh, well, <laughs> Dutch and Spanish are so far apart. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, it's working out. Yeah. Good. So the first thing we have here is, who is a Latino? How do you know the person is a Latino or Hispanic? But really the most obvious. Ask <laughs> 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 When you talk someone on the phone, probably you will be able to identify the Hispanic with the accent. That's the way I talk. Um, what else? What would be another easy way to identify the Hispanic? How do you <laughs> what happened? Uh, Friday, what day is today? Saturday, right? Well, Thursday, I did a seminar. And Emily Brink wanted for me to speak to pastors who are working in Hispanic churches. So my presentation was principles of worship for Hispanic pastors. Guess how many Hispanic kids? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I had 25 people from Sri Lanka, from Pakistan, mm -hmm. from India, from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And some Americans, they were interested, you know, to know how to minister to the Hispanic community. But what was funny, <laughs> I saw a lady and I started speaking Spanish to her. 
yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm from Sri Lanka. <laughs> I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> that because, you know, the color of the skin. That's why, you know, um, a lot of Latin American countries are sending missionaries to uh, uh, Arab countries because for us it's easier to mix with mm -hmm. them. When they see a white, blue eyes, you know, it's very noticeable. But for us, when uh, one time uh, we visit Greece, my wife, you know, my story is so interesting. I met my wife here in the United States and her ancestors, grandparents came from Greece. So we went to visit the relatives there and people talked to me in Turkish. They thought I was Turk. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so uh, the first thing, who is a Latino? There are many kind of Latinos, talking about, you know, physical uh, features. For example, you will find Latinos, uh, when Bolivia, probably, probably most people in Bolivia are like me, right? You know, have, have, have Indian, have Spanish. But if you go to countries like Argentina, you will see white people, blue you know, eyes, blonde people, and they are Hispanic. Well, when you go to Spain, you will pass by a Spaniard. Mm -hmm. Maybe in Catalonia. So really, sometimes it's difficult to identify his anger because the way he looks. So this is the, the first thing. Um, now, the relevance really of talking about Hispanic uh, worship uh, practice in the United States is because there's a lot, lot of Hispanics now in the United States. Look at this. These were some projections. Uh, you can see this is in. This is percentage of the total population in the United States. So right now, we are about here, but this is over, this is, these were projections. There are about 50 million Hispanics living in the United States. 50 million. We can see here in 1980, this is the state that most Hispanic population live. Uh, California, Texas, Arizona, some in Florida. But look what happened in 1990. Growing and growing and growing. How about in 2006? <laughs> okay, uh, Ram Rapids will be where some thick. You see all this expanding population here. Florida is not as a California or Texas. They say in Florida, I don't know if this is true or not, there will be signs and stores that it says English spoken here. Yeah. <laughs> Every life is Spanish. <laughs> And someone told me to get a job in Florida, you have to be bilingual. Very difficult to get jobs, for example, in schools you're teaching. But some parts in Texas, too, you have to be bilingual. Because uh, wanted or not, we're here to stay. <laughs> well, I'm planning to retire when I'm out there. Most people come here to stay, but anyway. Uh, 44, 3 million, that was in 2006. So really, the idea, there's a lot of Hispanics. So I'm glad that you are interested, you know, to know more about Hispanic practices because soon or late, when you go to Walmart, when you go to Best Buy, all these places, you will find Hispanic people, right? They're everywhere. Uh, California in 2006, they had 13 million people. Texas, uh, Florida, New York. Can you mind? California has more Hispanics than the total population of my country. Guatemala is 11 million. Bolivia, remember how many million? But see, just one state, United States, have more people than one country in Central America. Um, in Florida, we're talking about a lot of uh, Cubans, um, Hispanic population of the region. Now, these uh, figures are changing every day, of course, because Hispanics has a lot of families. They're very productive. <laughs> yeah. uh, Anglo, I don't know, Korean, no Asian cultures, but uh, in Hispanics, um, that's the idea. To the more children we have, the better. And remember that some of the Hispanics here in the States, they come from a Catholic background. And they have different ideas about uh, how many children they should have. OK, how about religion? Supposedly, most Hispanics here are Catholic. But this is, I think uh, these numbers are changing. This was, this was done in 2007. 68% were Catholic because most people come from Latin America, Mexico, the tradition are Catholic. Now, things are changing. In my country, Guatemala, we have 25 or 30 percent are evangelicals now of the total population of Guatemala. Mm -hmm. uh, in my country, we have maybe uh, 20 radio stations, Christian radio stations, two or three TV channels, two universities. In huge churches, churches that have three, four thousand members in Guatemala. 
So it, it, it's growing. But in general, people that you will meet here in the United States, they are Catholic. <coughs> Only 10% are uh, Protestant. All the Christians, say 3%. Um, we already said that there's not a typical Latino. It depends where you live. If you live in Florida, most his Latino, Hispanics that you will meet, they come from Cuba. If you live in New York, where most people you will meet are from the Dominican Republic, from Puerto Rico. I don't think you will see a lot of Guatemalans in places like uh, North Carolina, probably. So it depends. Now, uh, it's not only social. See, in every culture, there are differences, right? Middle class, lower class, uh, people who doesn't have bachelor's degree. But uh, with the Latino, we have to take in consideration where they come from, where their ethnicity. Um, there are cultural differences. See, here's Guatemala, and here's El Salvador. So Salvador is a very small country. We speak basically the same language, but we have different customs, we have different food. Completely different. Sometimes I go to El Salvador, I don't, I don't, I don't understand what they're saying. You, they use different expressions. Uh, the sense of humor is so different from someone from Colombia, someone from Puerto Rico, someone from Chile. So please never say, oh, all the Latinos are the same. Probably look the same, but we're not the same. Well, and remember, like Belize, uh, they speak English, for example. Uh, Brazil, this is another problem with Brazil, because it's in Latin America, but they speak Portuguese. And they don't like when people call them Hispanic or Latino. It's almost like an insult. Oh no, we are uh, Brazilian, and we speak Portuguese. And you know what Portuguese is? The definition of Portuguese is when a drunk Frenchman tries to speak Spanish. This is Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> because some, oh, they say the same about Spanish. Anyway. <laughs> now, in general, you will see basically two types of Latinos, people who were born out, outside the United States, like me. Okay? I came here when I was, uh, well, first time in 22, 23, when I did my master's, went back to Guatemala, so I was not born here. The largest group is from Mexico, obviously, because this is so close. <coughs> now, maybe you have heard people saying, oh, how come you're the Hispanics they never incorporate to the mainstream? People say, my grandparents came from Sweden, from Germany. And you know, they assimilated to they speak English, they don't speak German at home, they don't watch uh, German TV channels. How come the Hispanics, you know, they want to keep you know, their own tradition, their own language? What's the difference? Well, the difference in Mexico is so close. Sweden, can you mind going to Sweden every summer? But I'm going from Texas, for example, to Mexico, it's just a matter of hours. And right now, in Texas, where I live, there are three uh, TV stations in Spanish, Univision, so people can watch TV in their own language. They can read papers. There are supermarket. There are everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know the Hispanic culture is so prevalent you know, because there is a lot of uh, factors to preserve the culture. Um, Latin America, say Brazil, was it? Some people come from the Caribbean. See, Caribbean is not Latin America. With really. Cuba. Well, some people they say they're Latin America, but there's like Caribbean island, uh, Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic. See, the way that they speak Spanish in the Dominican Republic is completely different from the Spanish they speak in Guatemala. Yeah. Okay, the language is what we have in common. Um, how do I go back? Okay, I think so. No, I'm going. See, I'm not used to this. No, Do you know how to. I Maybe I'll we'll choose the arrow keys. Maybe. Yeah, just press back and arrow keys. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, okay, you will find at least three kinds of uh, Hispanic churches in the United States. One is a monolingual with Spanish. It's Spoken only, everything is Spanish. The sermon, the song, the announcements. This is one kind of church. Another church is bilingual. Sometimes you will find people who are second, third generations. But see, for me, it's so interesting. When I came here to the states, for me, it was like a shock. Sometimes I go to Hispanic churches and everything was in English. And I say, 
why do they, they use English when this is a Hispanic church? Why they don't go to an Anglo church? And I know people that they were born here, they went to school here, they had friends, they, everything, the culture is American, but they don't feel comfortable going to the Anglo church. That's why they go to these Hispanic churches when they mix. Now sometimes it's so boring and tiring going to bilingual church because everything is repeated in two languages. Can you mind the sermon you hear twice? Now I did announcement, the songs, one stanza will be in English, the three friends will be in Spanish. So <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, and there, believe it or not, there are some churches that English spoken only in the service. And it's actually Spanish church. It is the minority, but there are some churches. There, we want to uh, see that there are some social, some cultural reasons why the people who speak English only they don't go to an Anglo church. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, when, like my grandparents came from the Netherlands. Okay. Okay, and they were, you know, they were young when they came here. But I mean, when they all they knew was, was Dutch. Uh -huh. But when they had children in America, they they did not Speak teach them. them. Exactly. They did not they, they told them to learn that happened to my wife to English. Mm -hmm. And that was and so now the Dutchmen are saying, okay, now we have my grandparents and I had to learn English. Mm -hmm. Why are not the people from <laughs> you know the southern countries you know, they come to the United States, yeah. they want everything the United States has, but they want to keep their own yeah, language and their customs. And there's places here in Grand Rapids that you can't work because if you don't speak Spanish, you can't you can't tell anybody yeah. you know what you're talking yeah, about. Exactly. Now I would say this happens mainly with adults because kids when they go to school in one two years they're completely bilingual. Yeah. Right. So th this Correct. is a difference. But at home they will speak in Spanish. So, but see again when your parents came from the Netherlands, I don't think they can uh, go to a store and buy all the kind of things that you buy in. Right? You didn't watch TV in Dutch. You have to watch, the TV, uh, watch TV in, in English. But see, this is that's why you know sometimes it's very difficult to get assimilated in the culture when there's millions of people. Right. Yeah. And remember, the some states in the United States belong to Mexico, California, mm -hmm. uh, Arizona, New Mexico. So some people even have ancestors that were there before. The Anglo people came and took all this uh, because there were wars and agreements and all this. So some people are saying, "Well, we're not illegal here. You are the one who came illegally and took our property <laughs> land." <laughs> so, yeah, but you're right. But the, the difference is that Mexico is so close to the United States. And there's so many. Exactly, exactly. Really, for me, living in Texas, I, if I don't speak English, I can live fine. Yeah, really, because instead the stores are in Spanish. And in Florida, for example, I think uh, all the government documents are in two languages. In Texas, I don't remember, but in Florida, by law, when you fill a government form, everything has to be in Spanish. And see, politicians are very smart, yeah, because they know that the Latino vote is very important right now. So, so there are some cultural, geographical reasons why is the people don't assimilate as fast. Now, some people are saying in the future, if you talk to second, third generation of Hispanics, for example, it's different because they are forgetting what is to be Latino. Mm -hmm. So they are really getting more assimilated into the uh, mainstream culture. But that's a good, very so good culture. So if the good Lord doesn't come in time, you know, real soon, we'll probably have a lot more people that are oh, speaking yes. English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. So it's yeah. just a matter of time. But See, sometimes I don't see really there's a problem. When you go to Switzerland, they speak four languages. Yeah. Right. They speak uh, French, Italian, German, and the Swiss uh, dialect. And nobody complains about this. Now, it's true, almost everybody will know four languages they can communicate. But in Switzerland, there are some cantons, I think they call it, like uh, mm -hmm. but only French. Canada, they have mm -hmm. two official languages. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's possible to have two official languages in the United States? I don't think why not. But you're in Spanish today, so you're, 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 you can say alabare, alabare. When you don't understand anything, you can say alabare. <laughs> yeah, that's, I can always say that one. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Um, some of the characteristics of uh, worship practice in the Hispanic church. One is improvisatory. 
Well, maybe you have seen already an example when the computer is going <laughs> forward, you have to improvise. Now, some um, I know this because I have taken a lot of uh, mission teams to, to Guatemala, all the countries, and some Americans, they suffer. First, because not, not everything starts on time. See, this is I know. And I have to tell the people, listen, you are not in your own country. You have to be flexible. Yes, I know. Calm. Um, this is one of the characteristics in general. Now, there are some people, uh, Hispanic, that are so time-oriented, even worse than Germans or Americans. But in general, this is one character for improvise everything. That's why if you have to talk to a Hispanic pastor or a Hispanic worship leader and ask him, what are the songs you're doing in two weeks? Probably say, I don't know yet. It's too early to plan. Planning vacations a year ahead, that's impossible. You plan maybe the week before, the day, uh, when you start vacation, okay, let's go to some place and then we go. Um, another concept that Justo Gonzalez, I think in your handout you have a bibliography. If you will be interested to read more about Hispanic culture, Justo Gonzalez is a Cuban American. See, this is another thing when we talk about uh, Mexican American, Cuban American. I hope that someday we'll say just American, right? Because when people come here, you don't say you're Dutch American. You're Italian, well, Italian American maybe, but anyway. So you have uh, uh, five or six books. So Justo Gonzalez in Alabal, the Hispanic Christian Worship, talks about the concept of fiesta. And it's true. Some churches in Hispanic uh, churches are like a fiesta. Even the way that they decorate, the sanctuary, you know, with uh, color, it's like a birthday party in some churches. You know? uh, some people, uh, they, it's fine to mix colors. See, if here in the States, if you see if you have green, then uh, white, beige, everything has to be, you know, kind of like, if you go to a classroom in Latin America, one wall will be red, this will be green, and probably the desk will be purple. And everything is, is happy with this. Because that's the idea of fiesta. Now, when you plan a fiesta, a uh, uh, party, when you plan a party, of course you have to plan. You go to the supermarket, buy paper plates, right? You prepare refreshments. But really, you don't rehearse unless you are a very, very structured person that practices. Okay, when my guests come, I say, hello, how are you doing? I will take them to the living room. Maybe some people practice everything. <laughs> and then 10 minutes after everybody came, they are going to play some music. And the next five minutes will be some dancing. <laughs> Probably there's some people like this in the Hispanic culture, never, you never plan. So that's why the services sometimes are very long. Yeah. Try a wedding. Oh, yeah, I know. Well, they say in Russia it's even worse. I've been told that in services they have five or six sermons in one service. So you get tired of listening to one sermon, can you make five or six sermons? But anyway, so that's the idea that sometimes we plan but we don't rehearse. Uh, see, just the concept that the service starts on time. <laughs> this is so boring to other cultures. And please, when you take mission trips, remember this, other culture. I don't think one culture is better than another one. I don't think so. They're just different, that's right? Because, uh, for example, for concerts in Latin America, even every, every, everybody is ready. The orchestra is ready, the pianist is ready, everything is ready. The concert was advertised to start at 8. They don't start at 8. It's considered unpolite, bad manners. <laughs> yeah, so you wait, let's wait maybe 10, 15 minutes. If you are invited to a party, and you will ask, what time should I come? Oh, 3 o'clock. And you show up, you show up at 3 o'clock, it's considered rude, uh, because you're supposed to wait maybe 30 minutes, one hour. I was reading a story, someone was invited to a barbecue, 5 o'clock, <coughs> Hispanic family. And the American guys show up at 5 o'clock. <laughs> Nobody was at home, they were at Walmart buying all <laughs> the meat and the <laughs> things for the barbecue. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is very true. Uh, relational is very important. See, this is another cultural difference. For example, in Guatemala and other countries in Latin America, when I see my friends, uh, we hug each other, we kiss each other. See? But here in this culture, it's a matter of okay, in fact, uh, give a hug or a kiss, for example, to a kid in the city square, they can accuse me of uh, you know, sexual harassment or something like this. But in other cultures, it's very normal. For example, in the Latin American culture, every time you see your friend, you shake hands. 
And this, this is something that we come from Latin America and we need to learn. You only shake hands when you uh, get to know the person for the first time. But in Latin America, with uh, my colleagues, you remember this in Bolivia? Yeah. So it's very relational. More emotional than intellectual. That's why Pentecostal churches grow so fast. That's my culture. Because it's too bad that my computer was working. I have some, or maybe I can show a little, some videos from my computer. Um, in the um, Pentecostal churches, you know, they're very emotional. You know, they clap, they jump, and then, uh, so people feel free because this is part of the, of the culture. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe you have noticed the way I use my hands all the time. I can teach like this. And also I move a lot. So this is because I, <laughs> I grew up you know, in this uh, culture where you have to, uh, to move a lot. So um, more emotional and intellectual. And this is something if you are involved in a, a ministry in Spanish, you need to keep this in mind. Uh, I don't think a lot of Hispanics like you know, to meditate or talk about theology. But they will love to sing, they will love maybe to recite a poem, yeah, because this is more part of, of the culture, more emotional. Talking about musical practices, since most music is learned by rote, there is limitation in musical performances. In general, people, well, we are like oral cultures. You know, people learn just by listening and repeating. In church, in schools, in Latin America, they do a lot of memorization. And unfortunately, they are not encouraging kids you know, to have like, critical thinking. Well, same here in the States. Right now, kids are not just practicing to take the test. Mm -hmm. So they go to school not to learn, you know, to solve problems, but yeah, you know, to be prepared for the test. So this is very bad because uh, really we're not creative people who can take decisions on their own. But in general, um, people learn music in Guatemala by road. Now, it's amazing. I'm not exaggerating. There is a children's choir in one month. They learned the whole Messiah. I'm not talking about the Hallelujah only. The whole Messiah, three hour mm -hmm. concert. And they did it four parts from memory. Yeah. In the same group, their memory I was there in July and visited the choir, and they're memorizing the whole book of Proverbs. Kids. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's so easy because they are used you know, to learn things by, by rote. So that's why the use of hymnals is not very successful in Hispanic churches. Well, even in Anglo churches, you know, this, everything is in the PowerPoint. Yeah, because it's another culture. They are not used, you know, to read. It's very good. And they don't want to mess with the notes, for example. It's better to have just the, the words. Scripture reading is now projected in the PowerPoint, so people don't have to read the Bible. See, in some ways, I think the American culture is going oral, you know, a visual, of course. Mm -hmm. Computer, and all of this. Um, so, for example, if they sing coritos, if, is it when piano working? Uh, I'm not sure. If it's well, what I'm saying is, um, since, since people don't know much about music theory, all the <laughs> Well, well, <laughs> what I'm saying is that most songs, they will sing maybe uh, 10, 12 songs, and all the songs are in the same key. Because people who are playing the keyboard, people who are playing the guitar, they don't know a lot of theory, so they can... Uh, <laughs> These festivals, we hear a lot of changes in harmony, and that's why you know it's uh, pleasant to our ears. But when people don't know much about music, they just learn two or three chords, that's all they play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you will see this in a lot of Hispanic um, churches. Um, limited uh, musical uh, knowledge. Now, some of the concepts that are present in the Hispanic worship service are the mestizo. The mestizo is a mixture. Almost, well, no, all, uh, I would say maybe 75%, 80% of people from Latin America were considered mestizos. Well, in Guatemala, it's not true. 
because we have a lot of people that come from the mines. And they still speak, talking about you know, preserving the culture. Sometimes I will go to villages in my own country and I need a translator because not everybody speaks Spanish. Spanish is the official language, but there's some part that people speak their own uh, language, the Mayan languages. So this is a concept that we mix. And people, Hispanic people who live in the States, obviously they're mixing something you know, with the American culture, uh, some expressions, the way that they dress. For example, in Texas, I, love, I see a lot of Hispanic kids uh, wearing uh, clothes like black kids. You know, these low pants and huge uh, t-shirts. Mm -hmm. See, they're copying what they see from the black kids. Uh, exile. Well, some people really come here to the States as uh, refugees. For example, you go to Florida, you go to Cuba, or from El Salvador, from the Salvador, come here from the civil wars. So really, uh, this is a concept that you will find present in services. That people say, okay, we're here in the United States, but really this is not our final destination. And but people who come illegally, the worst thing that can happen to them is that they are deported, right? But it's fine, they can go back to their country. But people who come as refugees, can you imagine? They will come just with one suitcase, and that's all. They can't go back to the country to the political situation. So this is one um, concept, one um, uh, trait that you will find in Hispanic worship services, the concept of pilgrims, especially people who work in the agricultural you know, in California. They, when they can find a job, they will go to Texas. Then they will move to Florida. So they're everywhere, a lot of families. Thousands of people live this way. So that's the idea of pilgrims. And we already talk about uh, fiesta, a party is planned but no rehearsed. Decorations, and you a lot of service in the Hispanic uh, church and with a meal. Yeah. And they don't plan like a month ahead, you know, who will <laughs> bring something. No, okay, they will go and buy something, or I have some frijoles, some tacos, and everybody will. Uh, for example, my wife is so interested. My, I told my wife it was American, so we have to compromise a lot. <coughs> because sometimes I would like to invite friends just to come and you know, have a cup of coffee. And if there's something to eat, it's fine. Oh, she got some. I said, why you didn't tell me? <laughs> I said, you don't have to prepare it. It's just, you know, fellowship. But, you know, for Americans, it's very important to have everything planned. The menu. You have to have the menu ready. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is uh, different with the Hispanic uh, culture. Three factors that uh, play a very important role in the Hispanic worship. One is country, where they come from. Remember, a Colombian uh, worship service will be different from Argentina, for example. Brazilian, uh, well, I'm talking about Brazil. Uh, Venezuela, another country that they use a lot of salsa. For example, if you go to Guatemala, you never will hear people, you know, moving like the salsa. Uh, we use more marimba, it's more like dance, like waltz dancing. But in other countries, there's you know, a lot of movement and all of this, so we have to take this in consideration. It depends where the people come from. The denomination, this is very important. Method, Hispanic Methodists, for example, the tendency is to have more traditional services. I have a video of a church in New Jersey, and they use piano, and they sing hymns from the hymn book still. But if you go, of course, to uh, Pentecostal, it will be completely different. Baptists were in between. We are kind of lively, but we're still kind of traditional. So it depends on you know, the denomination. Uh, and generation. If you're dealing, ministering with people who were born here in the United States, second, third generation, completely different from people who came from Latin America, outsiders like me. Uh, were born in another country. So generation is very important. Um, now, we already talked about this. The Hispanic popular Protestant religion is more narrative, barrel, or war-centered in contrast with Catholicism. Have you ever visited a Catholic home, a Hispanic Catholic home? If you visit a Hispanic Catholic home, you will see a statue of the Virgin, Virgen de Guadalupe. It's like they have an altar. And they have candles, they have flowers, because this is part of the popular religion. Um, now, what happened with someone come from a Catholic ba background and becomes evangelical? The pastors tell them, okay, you have to leave all of this. This is idolatry. We don't worship the Mary, we don't worship the saints. So the center of the service is more on the, on the 
observe on testimonies. If you visit a home of a evangelical Hispanic, you will see pictures of saints, pictures of the Virgin Mary. So that's why it says here that, um, well, in general, evangelicals, I don't think we're more, uh, for example, you go to a typical church, you won't see a crucifix. You don't see sculpture. Now the Reformed Church, maybe they're more sim. They use more symbols. Remember last was last night when they did uh, Psalm 23, that they brought a cup and then they brought a tablecloth. Everything has a symbol. In Baptist churches, you never will see this. Baptist churches, the platform is empty. Uh, but you go to Episcopal church, they will see a cross. So this is uh, very important. Popular. There's a lot of things that. Uh, we do in Hispanic churches that are like popular religion. The celebration of quinceañera. You know what quinceañera is? It's when a girl turns 15 year old. It's a big event in the family of Hispanic person. For girls, they don't do anything for boys. That's discrimination. <laughs> so when a girl turns 15, you know, they will have a beautiful, like a wedding. They will have attendance. 14 girls, you know. Mm. They roll, you know, it's like a wedding. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, a ring is given to the girl, and they spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars. They give an invitation, it's a huge reception. Um, because it's a very important part of the, of the culture. Oh, this was a study done in Texas. At that time, 2002, there were 1,128 churches. Are you, is anybody here Baptist? I grew up Baptist. You know, they say when there are two Baptists, there are three opinions. <laughs> See, we have so many uh, divisions among Baptists. In Texas, we have three conventions. Um, so these churches that were uh, part of the study were affiliated at one. BGT means the Baptist General Convention of Texas. Um, how interesting. Only 14.5% of people responded. Now, I've done a lot of research research, and it's so difficult to do research, well, in almost in any culture, but in Latin America, <laughs> my dissertation was music education in three countries in Central America, Costa Rica, Honduras, and Guatemala. It took me two years just to get, you know, the surveys done, because people, they don't have, you know, this research culture. Well, even here in the state, who wants to fill, you know, a survey with 20 questions, unless they promise you that mm -hmm. you will enter a contest or something like this. But anyway, uh, the churches that um, responded, 54% were Spanish language only. Remember, we talk about the three kinds of Spanish churches in the United States. The other were bilingual, bicultural, 45%, and only 1% of the churches survey they use English only. Now, what were some of the findings of this uh, survey? Um, very interesting. Only 45% of the congregations that use Spanish use politics. Very interesting. And bilingual in all the churches. Because they are more assimilated in the American culture than almost every evangelical church in the United States, I think, use some polity. Uh, instruments, there is not much difference, really. Now, this is very interesting. Spanish-only churches, they use the worship to evangelize. So at the end of the sermon, always will be an invitation. Will be an evangelistic sermon in Spanish-only. So you can see in bilingual church, only 25% use worship services uh, to idealize people. What do you think is that? It's different. Well, if it's more emotional, then the sermon would be more an intellectual part, probably. Okay, okay. Good. Remember, I said that um, most people come from another country, they come from a Catholic background. Now, in Latin America, we don't consider Catholic Christians. I know for some people it's a shock. I say Catholics are Here in the States, I think they consider Catholics as another denomination, right? Some people. But in our countries, because the Catholicism in Latin America is so different from here. It's almost superstitious. Mm -hmm. and, and really, if you study the basic doctrines of Catholicism, at least in my opinion, I don't think they, they really follow what the Bible says. They worship Mary. Mary is the mother of God. No, mother of Jesus, according to them, is mother of God. So that's why you can pray to Mary. Again, the figure of mother is very important in Hispanic culture. So they say, well, 
uh, Mary is not God, but since Mary is the mother of God, I can talk to her and she can help me mm -hmm. to communicate with God. See, that, that's one of the basic of uh, Catholics. When you die, they have to pray for you, they have to do Mass. Even when the Pope dies, they have to do Masses for his salvation. See, that's why we say in Latin American Catholics they need to uh, become Christians. But anyway, so that's why when people come from other countries, their emphasis, they, they have more passion to evangelize. When they're here in the States, since almost everybody is Christian, evangelical, I don't think, I, I don't see the need you know, to evangelize because everybody's a Christian. So maybe that's why one of the, the reasons for these differences that we find here. Future trends. Almost everybody think at that time, 2002, that we need more contextual and contemporary services. Music, see, no hymnals. These people think that the future is in bilingual churches. And they want more variety of instruments. It's true, in churches that I visit, in Texas, Hispanic churches, they use exactly the same instruments. They use electronic uh, keyboard, uh, electrical guitar, drums, and maybe a tambourine. Some churches use congas. But you rarely will see uh, people using flute or acoustic guitar, which for me is bad. It is that they were just using electronic music. They're forgetting that all the instruments. See, that's the beauty of these services here. Have you noticed? You know, the combination, the variety of instruments. So this is something that churches are expecting. <coughs> and we like to uh, see more instruments used in the services. Why? Uh, people were asked, why do you go to a church where only Spanish is used? <coughs> people say, because uh, the language, of course, music in Latin style, Worship with similar immigrant experiences. So people like to go to the Spanish church because they will see someone they have the same experiences. Can you mind if someone came here say, as illegal, had a lot of trouble, finally got his papers, he goes to an Anglo church. They don't have anything in common, you know, with the person who work here in the United States. So that's why a lot of people go because they find similar experiences. Um, for some of these people, music is more important than preaching. Can you make this? No hymnals and worship service evangelized. In bilingual church, they like because it's contemporary music, and they have they say they have opportunity for all people to worship with the children. Sometimes the grandparents, we're talking about these grandparents that don't know English, but the grandchildren speak English. So that's why a lot of people go to these bicultural bilingual churches because they like this. Now, people who go to English only the reason they give is because blended service, casual atmosphere, younger families, etc. Social economic communication reasons too. Uh, the conclusions of this study the Spanish only congregations are less inclined to follow a preset or a worship. Remember the other mouth being spontaneous, non structure Second, Spanish language congregations use the worship service to evangelize more than bilingual churches. And there's a concern for using two languages in Spanish and bilingual churches. Sometimes their churches almost divide, they split, because some people would like to have just Spanish. Other people say, no, we are here in the States, and we need to use both languages. So sometimes it's a cause of mission. So there's a concern about uh, the use of languages in, in services. Now, it's very interesting. It's exactly the same with the Korean culture. Uh, parents came from Korea, but the kids were born here in the United States, so they didn't want to have you know, the Korean uh, way you know, to worship, for example. Korean services are long too because everybody has the opportunity to give a testimony. Uh, long prayers in the Korean services too. Um, this is something I started to write about that in Latin America, for example, we were conquered by uh, Spain and Portugal in the 16th century. So they brought a lot of things that changed completely our cultures. For example, in Guatemala, we have the Mayan culture. In Mexico, the Aztec. In South America, the Inca. And when the Spaniards came, you know, they almost destroyed everything in the name of the religion. They wanted everybody to be Christian. So they destroyed all these beautiful temples. They told people that everybody has to uh, speak Spanish, for example. They were not very su successful. Because I say in countries like Bolivia, I think they speak Quechua, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, other countries. But anyway, what I'm saying that always had been this foreign element. Then the missionaries came in the 19th century, and they, see, I grew up singing hymns. That's why people say, how come you're so familiar with so many hymns? Because I grew up missionaries who came to Guatemala, they told that 
only piano and organ should be used in services. And I grew up, I never saw a guitar. If you play a tambourine, you're Pentecostal. <laughs> Get out of this church. We were Baptists. We're not supposed to. But clapping, even clapping. Right now, everybody not claps so like this. But uh, in the past, you know, it was very, very conservative. So, and now people, young people in Latin America, they want to imitate what they see in YouTube and in all the videos. So the idea of this praise team, everybody with a microphone and the worship leader, that's come from the States. Do you go to a church in Bolivia? Do you see this? Yes. See? It's exactly the same. Now, this is universal. Since I started teaching in the seminary, I had the opportunity to travel. I went to Italy one time, and I, I went to a service, and I thought someone would be playing a mandolin or some type of Italian music. Everything was contemporary, translated from here from the United States and from, from England. Yeah. Um, I've been to Spain. I expected, you know, guitar, flamenco, Castanet, um, forget everything. Some churches, you don't have this, you're not worshiping God. You have to have <laughs> an electronic <laughs> keyboard, it's better if it's cork, uh, <laughs> drums, and electrical guitar. Yeah, it's, it's like a format. Somebody has been, uh, not imposed, but imported. So I hope someday we develop our own mm. instrument own way of worship, but maybe it will take some generations. Um, what type of music we use in Spanish churches? The traditional corinto, remember the corinto? Let's sing our corinto again, so we don't forget. <laughs> Contemporary North American Christian music translated into Spanish. Sometimes you will hear uh, contemporary Latin American uh, Christian music that people are writing. Um, Carlos Colón, tall guy who um, led one of the songs last night. He was my piano student in Guatemala 30 years ago. He's from El Salvador and he is writing a lot of songs. Yvette, you also saw the, the lady, the girl who played piano, she's a beautiful. She's writing a lot of songs. And in your book, I think we have some Latin American songs, right? Okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, but again, if people don't, don't know how to read music, even if they have the hymn, they can read the song. They have to listen in the CD, or right now on YouTube, and then they can learn. Um, now, I am, I'm involved in a movement uh, called Ethnodoxology. I remember the ICE, I-C-E, if you're interested in multicultural uh, music, ICE. You go to the internet and you will find a lot of resources. It's the International Council. This is a new word, ethno -doxologist. Ethno means what? Culture. Yeah, culture, people. And doxology is praise. Yeah, that's, that's why we see the doxology. It comes from the Greek doxa, is glory. So this organization is trying that um, in every culture, people should write their own songs, mm -hmm. using their own rhythm, their mm -hmm. own instruments, their own language. And a lot of missionaries are going to countries just to help people. And what, what for me is so, so moving is that they're not talking only about music, but arts. Arts can be used in music. That's why I love this uh, symposium, because all the arts, we have seen dance, we see painting, 
the tradition of evangelicals, we thought that only music can be used in the church. You can use opera or drama. But it's sculpture. What else? You mentioned all the arts already. Yes. Dancing, exactly. Uh -huh. So I hope that someday we come when uh, we have an authentic, for example, Latin American Hispanic worship music. Right now we don't. It's like a combination. Now, this Alabaré probably will be very close to be a very typical, authentic form. Nobody knows who wrote it. It's anonymous. But almost in every country. You remember hearing this song in Bolivia? Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. It depends what church, you, what, what church you go there. I don't know what it was oh, called. We oh. went to a couple different ones. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, I have these videos, but we're not connecting right now, and not only the time is over anyway. Um, the problems that I found in current practice in churches, I already mentioned, this lack of musical training for music leaders. Some groups just imitate what they hear on radio or CDs, and usually it's a bad imitation. <laughs> lack of creativity in worship design, unclear purpose of music in worship and other ministers of the church. For example, sometimes the sermon will be about, uh, well, Easter. And then they're singing about the flood. And then they see, see there's no connection. Now, I've seen this in other churches too, right? There's no connection. It's like a fruit salad. Mm -hmm. Everything goes. So uh, we need, you know, to uh, help people to understand what is the really use of music and worship in everything being related to the other elements. I've seen a lot of communication with the pastor and other leaders, but this is almost in every church sometimes. Not necessarily in Hispanic churches. Okay. To, oh, another thing that I found is music is too loud. Sometimes you don't hear the words. You only hear boom, boom, <laughs> boom. <laughs> and I always say, I think we should learn from popular uh, music. When you hear, uh, go to hear, uh, tell me the name of a famous group, pop group, or singer. Uh, you know, what is your favorite pop singer? Um, brand new. Okay. When you go to a concert, they will have a lot of instruments, I'm sure, right? But you can understand the words, right? You can hear the words. And sometimes in services, because the bass is so loud, the drums will understand the words. <laughs> I don't think this is good. That's why I say I think it's a problem. Music cover the words. Praise team assume the role of a music group in a rock concert. <laughs> Why do you think people stand now and nowadays in services? Okay, we're going to sing. Now it's time for praise. Everybody immediately. You don't have to you know, tell people to uh, stand up. Where do you think this idea comes from? When I grew up, you can, you can sing uh, sitting. No problem. How come now you have to stand every time you sing? Where do you think it's coming from? So you don't fall asleep during the service. Okay. <laughs> Concerts. I think if you go to a rock, rock concert, have you been to a rock concert? Confess your things now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you sit in a chair when you go to a rock concert? Yeah, exactly. And then you just follow the prompt, oh, the next piece will be this. And then you sit still and <laughs> wait, and then you clap. No, you stand up and you move, right? So probably this comes from this idea. That's my own theory. Okay, It's not in the Bible, I'm saying that. Some of that. <laughs> a lot of things we do in church that come from the pop culture. We have to recognize this. The idea of a praise team, everybody with a microphone mm -hmm. and a worship with that comes, you know, from uh, pop groups. How they call this? The back, uh, backup singers or something like this? Unfortunately, some churches think that if they want to be contextualized, they have to have a praise team. So they're not doing choir. Choir, no, this is an old fashioned. <laughs> Why not? What I like of choir, the more people participate. Mm -hmm. In the praise team, in the same four people that they sing. Mm -hmm. So it has uh, advantages, disadvantages. Another thing I've seen in Hispanic and Anglo churches that the worship leader, leader assumes the role of a like, high priest. He's the only one who prays. Have you noticed? Mm -hmm. Now, maybe Reformed churches are different. The, the congregation uh, read the Bible, that they participate in praise. But in a lot of Baptist churches, in Texas, for example, the worship leader does everything. We sing for 30 minutes, stand up, and he finished this time of uh, praise uh, with, a, with a prayer. He never will ask, Please, so and so, can you come and lead us for prayer? You never will see this. So they are taking that, that monopolizing the service. And I think the, the service, the worship service, is from the whole congregation to God. We don't go to church to be entertained. But unfortunately, uh, 
Okay, I'm going to finish because. Um, oh, how to minister? First, you have to pray. If you want to minister in Spanish, you have to pray for wisdom, for common sense. It would be nice to do some type of study by type of people living in the community, where they come from. I would say this is very important. Some obstacles to overcome ministering in a Hispanic culture will be first language. Right? Now, sometimes you don't have to be completely bilingual. Sometimes if you smile to people, <laughs> yeah, smile is international. Um, cultural language, generational issues. Remember, when you're dealing with a Hispanic that came from another country, it's completely different when you were dealing with a second, third generation of Hispanics. Completely different. Involvement of the whole congregation. I think that, for example, if an Anglo church wants to start a Hispanic mission, I think the whole congregation should be involved. Pray, you know, maybe uh, helping the volunteers. In Texas, a lot of churches, probably here in Michigan, we have a Hispanic mission, then we have a Korean mission, Chinese, you know, everybody uh, from different groups, they never get together. For me, it's sad because if they're sharing the building, at least they should uh, have a fellowship once a year. And I think we'll be interested you know, for Anglos to try you know, the food of the Hispanics or the Koreans or Chinese. Remember, in heaven, all will be together in the same room. Okay? Well, I don't know if we'll be room, so how? But uh, there won't be Anglos or Chinese anymore. Everybody you know, will be just together as brothers and sisters in Christ, praising God. Uh, then my last um, email, uh, email. Oh, it is. Justo Gonzalez wrote this. He says, perhaps this is in our very multiplicity, multiplicity, Colombians, Guatemalans, Bolivians, Dominicans, the impossibility of defining and describing us as a whole. But maybe this is our contribution to the worship of the church at large lives. We have learned how to worship together, um, even though we're not all alike. Remember, all, not all Latinos are alike. We look alike, but we're not alike. We have learned how to do this by combining a spirit of fiesta with a profound sense of mystery. So we like fiesta, but also we like you know, to meditate, to reflect. And uh, the, 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 majesty, the majesty of God. Do you have any questions, some commentaries? I'm sorry I didn't give you more time for questions, but I wanted to share with you so many things. Any questions about ministering in Hispanic culture? I will encourage you to visit a Hispanic just experience. I think before you die, before you go to heaven, you should visit <coughs> a black church, <coughs> a Hispanic church, and maybe an Asian church. Because that's preparation for heaven. <laughs> okay, so there's no other questions. So thank you so much. And I really was very happy.